it's not HIV itself that's killing us, but it's rather that stigma attached to it. HIV was not a curse from God that people let us to believe back then, and that it can happen to anyone. What if I tell my family about my HIV status and they throw me out of the house? That was my biggest fear ever. Good day and a very warm welcome to this UNAID South Africa podcast with myself, Zenit Abdul, your host for this episode. Today, we will be discussing the impact of stigma and discrimination on people living with HIV. Annually, for the past 10 years, the United Nations Joint Program on HIV, or UNAIDS, observes the 1st of March as Zero Discrimination Day. And this year's theme is, to protect everyone's rights, protect everyone's health. You may ask, how does this theme relate to stigma and discrimination? Well, in South Africa, two studies, including the 2020-2021 Human Science Research Council HIV Stigma Index 2.0 survey, which included people living with HIV, the LGBTIQ plus community and key populations, as well as the 2023 State of Healthcare for Key Populations report by community-led monitoring organization Richitse, has highlighted the negative impact of stigma and discrimination in the sense that it is discouraging people from accessing health services. When people are denied health care, this is a violation of their human rights. When laws are in place to criminalize sexual orientation or services based on gender or lifestyle choices, people are discouraged from not only accessing health care, but the justice system as well. This is a violation of their human rights. Our guest for today is HIV activist Fahmida Miller. 57-year-old Fahmida Miller has been living with HIV for 30 years. She's the first Muslim woman in South Africa to have openly disclosed her HIV status. Growing up in Cape Town with a strict Islamic upbringing, she never once thought that she would one day be HIV positive, let alone an activist for people living with HIV. This is her lived experience. Fahmida, it is an honor to have you today. Welcome to the program and thank you so much for agreeing to do this with us. It's a pleasure indeed. Who exactly is Fahmida Miller? How do you describe yourself or see yourself? Basically, I am a very, I would say I'm a very private person. And um, becoming HIV positive actually um, changed my life, changed the person who I am today. My family, especially, they know me as, you know, the very timid, quiet person. I would never speak up. I would never, you know, I would just be the quiet one. Mm-hmm. But when it comes to, to HIV, you will you will hear my voice indeed. Mm. You say that HIV has changed you. In what way? I was basically forced to speak up and, you know, openly about HIV. When I was diagnosed in 1994, in South Africa, <clears throat> sorry, that time, people didn't talk much about HIV at all, let alone, you know, coming from a Muslim background. So, you know, I, I heard about HIV, but not like HIV. I heard, I heard about HIV as AIDS, not the term HIV. So what I heard was if you have AIDS, you will basically like, you know, just die off tomorrow or something like that. And if you do have AIDS, you know, you must have been like, you know, a kind of a naughty person. You must have, you know, indulged in sexual um, things and stuff like that. So for me, when I became HIV positive, <clears throat> it was really, you know, I, I cannot really express to someone how I felt at that moment in time. But let me take a step back. What happened was that um, in 1994, I got married. And um, when I met the person whom I got married to, you know, you cannot see HIV. But let alone, I didn't know at the time of marriage, he was already infected with the virus. So seven months later then, he passed on. And then what happened, um, I became very ill. And um, I went to the doctor, they did, you know, all these kinds of tests and stuff. And... um, Then the one doctor asked me, like, basically, have you been tested for for AIDS? 
you know, and for me it was like, like I said, you know, AIDS was just for a certain group of people. I certainly didn't fall into that category. But yeah, it happened. My results came back. I was diagnosed with, with AIDS. And then she even then gave me a lifespan of five to 10 years. And um, I needed to decide, what am I going to do? And I decided I'm not going to tell anyone that I am dying of AIDS. Because like I said, in South Africa, people didn't talk openly about it. So for me, it was really a devastating, a big blow for me. It's 1994 not much is known about HIV. You're diagnosed with AIDS. I mean, today we say you're diagnosed with HIV, um, you mm. know, but what does that feel like as a Muslim woman coming from this particular upbringing where, as you say, you kept yourself so-called pure, you, you kept exactly. in line within the Islamic mm -hmm. upbringing and the confines of the Islamic uh, teachings. Mm. Um, what did that feel like? Um, and what were some of the thoughts that went through your mind? I was very much afraid, afraid that my family would reject me. And um, I asked myself, what am I going to do? Am I going to die a lonely death? Who's going to bury me also, you know? A lot of thoughts went through my mind, but the most important one also, I didn't actually fear for myself. I feared more for my family, for my parents, because in my mind, I kind of brought shame upon them. What is the people going to say? What is the family going to say about them? You know, and especially, um, like I say, I got this from my late husband. And even today, a lot of people ask me this question, don't you hate him? I don't, because it happened. But back then, yes, I, I was scared. I was like very much afraid. And um, even today, I tell people, you know, it's not HIV itself that's killing us but it's rather that stigma attached to it and the ignorance of people. That is what's killing us. You are so afraid of what the next person is going to think of you, going to say about you, because you are now living with HIV. And like I will stress again, in Islam, people do not talk about HIV. It's a taboo subject. Mm. I mean, let alone, we don't even talk about sex. So what about HIV? So I was really devastated. What do I do? Do I tell my family or do I just give up and die a lonely death? The doctor suggested that I go for counseling. And I think that really helped me. But now you must also remember that time there was no Muslim support groups for people like myself living with HIV. So I basically joined a very staunch Christian support group. And I must say, you know, I've learned there that number one, HIV was not a curse from God that people let us to believe back then and that it can happen to anyone and regardless of your religion, of your color, your, you know, your background, whatever, it can happen to anyone. So that is one big thing that I've learned from them. And I think there is when I realized that I can live with the virus but I needed to take good care of myself. I needed to accept my own HIV status. And of course it wasn't easy because that time also there was no medication. You know, so how do you overcome this? How do you live with HIV? What do you do? What do you take? So the support group really um, opened up my mind. They opened up their hearts to me and they accepted me as one of their own. And that is why I said to myself, if ever one day I am okay with my own HIV status, if, if I am okay, you know, with having HIV, I will start a Muslim support group for people living with HIV. And Alhamdulillah, eventually I did. I finally did that, but it was a long journey before I came to that point. Because like I say, once again, my main concern what if I tell my family about my HIV status and they throw me out of the house? Where am I going to go? What am I going to do? That was my biggest fear ever. Can you talk to us a bit about the journey towards disclosure of your HIV status? You had this fear 
and we understand that it stems from the way people perceive a lot of myths and misconceptions around HIV. It is 1994. Mm-hmm. Today we are it's 30 years later 2024 mm. there's a lot more information about HIV but during that time there wasn't um how did you manage to disclose your HIV status uh, what was that experience like I think first of all I like I said I needed to make peace with the with my HIV status myself I needed to forgive my late husband for infecting me with the virus because this is what the doctor told me. You know, after going through my own medical history and all sorts of tests and stuff, it was then discovered that he was the one that infected me. After accepting my own HIV status, I now kind of have to tell my immediate family that is now my parents and my siblings. And although a part of me knew that my family will not reject me but you know this was not like mom dad i have the flu for example this was now mom dad i have aids you understand and on top of that i got it from the person to whom i got married to so when i eventually built up enough courage i turned back about three or four times i just told them you know I was crying and I just told him I'm sorry for bringing this bala upon you people um this curse you know that that is what people it is to believe still but this is what happened to me I have AIDS and the doctor told me that I have 5 to 10 years to live and um yeah that is it my my mom was very she was a bit cut up because I did not confide in her from the beginning she she said she would have supported me right away and my dad my late father um he told me his first words to me was you know what allah does not let anything happen to you without a reason so you you need to accept what happened to you and i actually felt guilty because what i did right at the beginning when i was diagnosed with hiv i stopped praying because why must i worship a god that you know put this curse or this bala on on to me because for me it was like you know i'm going to die tomorrow i didn't ask for this so why is god punishing me like this but after i made peace with all this like i say i started to pray again but when my dad uttered those words i felt extremely guilty i felt terrible even today still I can never ask for for more than enough forgiveness for what I did back then. But then again, I didn't know any better. You know, I just went with the flow, with what people let us to believe that it's a curse, you know. My parents in assured me that they will support me and that I don't have to tell anyone else unless I wanted to. And for two years, basically, I just stayed in our family. Just my siblings and my parents that knew about my HIV status. So I was sick at the time when I was diagnosed. I developed TB as well, tuberculosis, which you know, it goes hand in hand with HIV, especially here in the Western Cape. So I needed to go on the um, TB medication. So with that I started to kind of heal I gained weight and if you looked at me you would no longer say that I was ill so for me life was fine life was okay I attended a support group I met up with other people living with HIV I would you know follow their journeys and stuff but then um I realized that I needed to do something because like I said 2 years later in South Africa people now started to talk openly about HIV but how in a very cruel and you know very rude way i would say they would make fun of you and i didn't like that i couldn't stand up and say you know what it's okay if you have HIV you can live a long life with the virus but i couldn't i needed to keep quiet because nobody knew about me living with HIV and especially in our muslim community it was even worse so for me it was like something needed to change 
I decided I am going to make that change by disclosing my HIV status. What were some of the statements that you heard, some of those cruel statements that you heard? I, I clearly remember um, we were at the family dinner. You know, we, as a Muslim yourself, you know, we normally have big families. So we had a big family dinner and um, my cousin was sitting right next to me and um, she asked me to pass a, a slice of bread, you know, and what she suggested that I must um, take my hand instead of taking the plate. But what she said was like, take your hand or do you then have AIDS? But I knew deep down that she didn't know about me. It was just a statement that she made. But I didn't like it because I knew that I would not even infect her by taking my hand and give her the, the bread without taking the plate. But I got very upset. And that was one of the reasons. And the second one was our Muslim leaders, they also talked about people like, you know, like myself in a very negative way. And again, I couldn't, you know, stand up and say that, you know, as ulama, we needed your help. We needed you to help us and guide us because we didn't know any better living with HIV because I still had this notion in the back of my mind that, you know, it was a curse from Allah. But nevertheless, and another um, example that I can say, there was one of my other cousins also made a very bad comment saying that, you know, um, there was something wrong with our telephone line. And nobody could get um, through to us, you know, that time we had the landlines and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So he made a comment and said, oh, maybe the, someone said, oh, there's a virus on the line. And he said, oh, maybe the line has AIDS. And everybody laughed. And I was like, I felt terrible. And, you know, I felt angry. And there were lots of other issues, lots of other things which I'm not going to mention here. But the main part for me was that, like I say, I could no longer keep quiet because like I say, I didn't like the way people would look at us that are living with HIV. And I decided in 1996 World AIDS Day, I actually went on air on one of our Islamic radio stations and I disclosed my HIV status. How was that received? It, it was met with mixed feelings, which I, I mean, I expected that. But like I say, I was, a, I was at a point in my life I could no longer keep quiet. I needed to come out. I needed to disclose. I needed to let people know that we as Muslims are also infected living with HIV. And not just infected, but also affected. So when I went on air, I never told anyone, none of my family members knew that I'm going to speak on the radio station. And, um, but that particular slot had a call in session, like people could call in, give their views and opinions and stuff like that. But none of my family members called in. But I must say, the response of the community was overwhelming. From there, I've heard of other Muslim people that have died already because how they were discriminated against, you know, their families living with HIV. The family would call in and say so-and-so died because of, you know, so-and-so was rejected. And, and that made me decide that I am going to kind of start a support group. But my main problem was, like I said, my family didn't call in. And I mentioned my name, who I am, and, you know, the whole um, scenario. But that night, most of my family members came to the house and they were angry. Because in their mind, it was like, why did I disclose my HIV status? I should have kept quiet. Nobody needed to know. And, you know, for the first time since I was diagnosed in 1994, I actually cried. I broke down and I cried and I said to myself, I was stupid. What did I expect? Did I really think that my immediate or my extended family would support me? But another part of me said, you know, you did the right thing. It's by time that, that, you know, someone like myself 
openly, you know, talk about HIV. And then one of my aunts actually stood up. And she came to stand next to me. She put her arm around me and she said to me, you know what, my child? You grew up in front of me. I know you. And um, if no one else in this family will support you, I will support you. And I don't even care how you contracted this new disease. This is what she called it. I mean, that time people didn't know much about HIV at all. But I will support you. And while I, when she said that, I stopped crying. Because I had one person in my family that supported me. And I no longer cried. Like I say, it's been 30 years later. I then started my support group. My life changed. I became, I actually became the spokesperson for Muslim people living with HIV. Although later on, it extended to other faiths as well. I've given talks in all other religions, in all other faiths. You name it, I've been there. And I've, you know, I, that's why I said HIV actually opened up doors for me. It changed my life. I'm not proud of it. But that is who I who I became. I became the spokesperson, not like I said, not just for Muslim people, but for everyone infected or affected by HIV. And like I said, today, 30 years later, in my opinion, not much have really changed. People are still um, discriminating against people like myself. But I'm one of those strong people. I don't keep quiet when it comes to HIV. For example, I wear hijab, you know, I wear the scarf and the long dress and stuff. So when it's time for me to go to the clinic to go and fetch my medication, you know, normally HIV clinic is like one side. Everybody knows if you go there, you're going for your HIV medication. So when I come in, everybody's like looking at me, surprised, you know, a Muslim person coming for medication. You know, I kind of grew a, a thick skin. I don't care because I'm here to improve my health and to look after myself. And sometimes people will still make, you know, cruel remarks um, towards me. Like the other day um, when I took my mom for her blood and stuff, the receptionist, she looked at me and she asked me like, but aren't you Fahmida Muller, the lady that, that, that lives with, with AIDS? And I just looked at her, I didn't say anything. And then she said to me, I thought you died many years ago already. I just looked at her and I'm like, no, I'm still alive. That, you know, I was just like, I got annoyed because, you know, people think because of HIV you will die tomorrow. They have not took the ability or whatever to realize that, you know, we don't live in the dark ages anymore. You can live long with the virus. But like I say, unfortunately, it's not HIV that's killing us, but that stigma attached to it. Another point I wanted to make is the antiretroviral the treatment. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are still dying with HIV because of, you know, they don't have access to treatment. Why? Because I feel sometimes that healthcare workers also discriminate against people like us. You know, they look at you funny when you come or they will make nasty remarks about you coming for, for your ARVs. And I've spoken to a lot of people, they will tell me, no, they're not going to this clinic or that clinic because the nurses are funny with them. They will rather go out to other clinics in other areas, go there and get their treatment. And some, some of them will basically just give up saying, you know, what's the use of going for your ARVs? Because people are still discriminating against us. What would you say yeah. uh, are the contributing factors or what is fueling um, the stigma and the discrimination towards people living with HIV in South Africa? I, I think it's mainly the way a person contracts HIV. And as you know, in South Africa, the main way of contracting HIV is through um, intercourse, unprotected sex. So people just assume when you have HIV, that is how you contract the virus, and which is not true. You know, not all of us were infected like that. I mean, I have friends that have HIV from birth. They got it from the mother. You know, back then, again, there was no um, ARVs to, pre to prevent the mother to child, you know, transmission. So people were born with HIV. 
and some people um, got it um, via blood transfusion as well. So people just have this notion, you know, you were promiscuous, you were sleeping around, so it's good for you that you contracted HIV. They will not engage with you and ask you these type of questions. But for me, at the end of the day, I also, I will always say, it's not your um, problem how a person contracted HIV in any case. But what you need to do is to support that person, to be there for that person. Rather ask, how can I support you? And not, how did you contract HIV? Because that's none of your business. Because that is how people then stigmatize you. I take it from myself. When some of the, the community members heard about me now being HIV positive, that is what they also thought. You know, I was promiscuous and I slept around and blah, blah, blah. It's only when I came out with the full story, even our um, religious leaders, our imams, they had the same attitude. That is why they discriminated against me until I one day again went on air and dis disclosed my whole full story, how I contracted HIV. Then it was said, oh, then we must support her because she was married when she contracted HIV. Do you get what I'm saying? As if it mattered. Yes. <laughs> so then I said, you know, but it doesn't matter how you contract HIV. You can get it, like I said, as an unborn child or stuff like that. But for me, it was like, I was like angry again when I heard this. Okay, then it's fine to support her because of the way she contracted HIV. So they're even so that selective in who they choose to support. Exactly. Exactly. That is why people do not openly disclose their HIV status because of that. People ask you, oh, how did you contract it? And they will base the, um, you know, on that. So the discrimination on that, I would say. And that is why I don't blame people. In fact, I don't encourage people to disclose. Yes, you have to disclose to your partner. That is a different story. You started a support group called Positively Muslim. Uh, tell us mm -hmm. a little bit more about that. Look, like I've said, when I myself was looking for a support group, a Muslim support group. I couldn't find any. I decided then, back then, way back, that if ever I am okay with my HIV status and, you know, I'm still alive, I will then start a Muslim support group. And in the year 2000, yeah, I've managed to, to do that with the help of two other people. Um, they were very helpful and the group actually... Um, it lasted until 2012 because it had to close because of funding. We no longer received funding. Many people will tell me it's easy for you to come out and talk about it because you were married. People don't look at you twice. But when we come out, you know, people will judge them. HIV actually just became just like another any other disease. Although, yes, there's still a stigma attached to it, but in reality, you can live long with the virus. What would you say are some of the solutions or how can we challenge uh, stigma and discrimination? How can we oh. uh, eradicate uh, stigma and discrimination for people living with HIV? Look, look, that is a challenge on its own. I've traveled the world, I've been all over. And what I've discovered that all over, it's the same problem. The main thing is stigma and discrimination and everybody is talking about it. I've even, um, at one point, I worked at the University of Western Cape, where I worked with young people, you know, and I will also, you know, tell them or ask them, how can we do away with stigma and discrimination? And the only thing that, that people will come up with is like, people like myself that are living with the virus, we need to be vocal about it. We need to co continue talking about it that it can happen to anyone. This is how you can contract it. This is how you cannot contract HIV, you know, no? those kind of things. But the main thing is also that I would say, um, again, our religious leaders play a major role in this. You know, right at the beginning on World AIDS Day, the 1st of December, they were talking about HIV, you know, informing people, educating people about HIV. But that doesn't happen anymore. 
it also just died out. So you, the only person out there, I think it falls onto you to continue educating and informing people about HIV. Tell them, you know, you shouldn't discriminate people against, you know, living with HIV. If you are not sure about your HIV status, I would say, go and test yourself. Try and test yourself on a regular basis. That's all I can say. Don't assume that person is HIV negative. I will say demand that both of you go for an HIV test. Thank you very much for sharing uh, this particular journey with us. We sincerely appreciate no, your time. It's a pleasure. It was nice chatting with you, Zina. That was 57-year-old Fahmida Miller, who has been living with HIV for 30 years, the first Muslim woman in South Africa to have openly disclosed her HIV status, uh, talking to us about stigma and discrimination uh, and the impact of stigma and discrimination for pe on people living with HIV, talking about how many are deterred from accessing healthcare services, talking about how people on uh, the street Street family members, community members uh, would ostracize and reject and pass cruel uh, comments uh, based on a person's HIV status. Um, thank you very much for joining us today on this UN AIDS South Africa podcast, and we hope to see you again uh, in the next episode. Thank you.